My name is uh, Randy Mandel and I've been an activist for a long time in a number of issues. 2008, I got really interested in economics with the crash and really studied Michael Hudson on financialization and realized what a downward spiral we were in. And it didn't seem to be a way out of it. And then later I saw a presentation with Michael and Stephanie Kelton was really impressed and started looking to MIT modern money theory and realized that actually may be the only way out of this mess, which made it seem very, very important. And Vond and I and others have been working on this for a while and luckily to be working with Fadl. Uh, my presentation tonight is um, Modern Money and Green Economics for a New Era or you know, the Green New Deal. And I pick this for a first slide, kind of where we are at this moment, looking at the COVID um, pandemic, which is not over. And I, I kind of wonder if there's any way the Trump administration could have done a worse job on this. I, I don't see how. And, and that's not only with the public health and the stealing the supplies, but there was also the option to, um, which he never considered, to take um, payroll and actually nationalize it so people could be paid their previous salaries to stay at home, which is the appropriate job in a pandemic. So we're not looking at the huge economic problem that's coming. But we're in fact looking at a serious recession with a lot of pain and suffering for a lot of people. And right behind that is the climate change. And it's important that we get all these fires out pretty quickly. Now we weren't exactly starting off at a great place. Um, the New Deal kind of was under attack in the early 70s with Reagan accelerating through Reagan and beyond. And what we have is a financialized predatory economy where we are seeing a lot of concentration of wealth, a lot of inequality, and most of the population spiraling down. So a lot of the country is living in third world conditions. You're seeing a hugely traumatized population and unraveling of the social fabric. And people are right. They were not told the truth by either party or by the media. and. Um, the situation has been deteriorating. I don't know if you will remember this talk. This is in the 1990s by Noam Chomsky. He was early in the Clinton years. He was talking about Reagan and talking about just what a savage war Reagan had waged against working people, but was talking about the psychological impact on people, pointing out that people did not know what to believe, not, not, not know what to trust, hated everybody, and confused by corporate propaganda, not knowing who to blame, they were being susceptible to these crazy conspiracy theories and pointed out that the unraveling of society was very reminiscent of Germany in the 1930s. Um, with the 2008 crash and Barack Obama coming to power promising real hope, Michael Hudson pointed out that if Obama followed the Clinton playbook, which he did, and basically served Wall Street while ignoring Main Street, the next administration would be an absolute extreme right wing crazy person. And it's been pointed out by several people, including AOC, that if Biden doesn't get it right, you know, we could be in an even worse place in four years. So it's another thing of great urgency we have to deal with. With respect to the Obama administration, they very much did bail out Wall Street and pretty much, to put it gently, neglected Main Street. This is a slide that looks at the recovery after a recession and it's showing where the income goes after recession and the blue is to the bottom 90 percent wage earners families and the red is for the top 10 percent and before the country financialized after recession most of the gains went to the lower 90 percent of the population which is of course appropriate as we became a more financialized economy in the 70s you see that it reverses and with the um so-called obama recovery 120% of the gains went to the top 10%, including the people that caused the problem in the first place. And 90% of the population went backwards by about 20%. Now, this is not the recession. This is the recovery, which has to be superimposed on the recession. And it led to some very, very deep resentment, which probably played a role in Trump's getting elected. And people really hardened some pretty crazy ideas about whose fault this is and where to put the blame for you know, it is an unraveling society. You can show any number of images for the craziness. I, I just picked this one. Um, for the first time in the, at this time, 242 year history of the United States of America, a one-year-old child appears in court as a defendant. Now, complicating this, what we're gonna need is appropriate social programs to pull this together in terms of dealing with the recession, the climate, and all, all the harm that's already been inflicted. And 
if we accept what we've been taught, our hands are tied. If the government has to acquire taxes in order to spend, uh, most people don't have the means left to tax and no one has any capacity to pay taxes. People are barely gaining by as it is. And second, we're told that if the government spends, it's gonna increase the deficit and that's a big problem. Now, both those statements are not true. I thought Vana did an excellent job explaining that and I'll touch on it briefly, but it or reinforce that briefly, but it opens the space for us to actually rapidly and aggressively fund the social programs that we're gonna to need to put these fires out and put them out fast. And I think the other good news is even what we call red states, a lot of the people are really hungry for meaningful change and are very willing to work together if there's a sincere effort to bring about the policies that in fact we're all gonna need. Uh, one of my favorite candidates was um, Charles Booker who ran in Kentucky and a lot of questions about how that election went, but he points out that progressives should show up and listen to deep red districts. There's a real opening there for people to work together. A friend of ours, Chris Armitage, ran in Spokane in Eastern Washington and also a pretty red district and pointed out people were very open for change. In fact, AOC was pretty popular there. There was a real opportunity if you were sincerely gonna bring the programs they needed to work together. And um, Abdul El Saeed, after his campaign recently said, uh, during my campaign, we found something remarkable. Urban, rural, and suburban Michiganders from all races, faiths, genders, and sexual orientations actually worried about the same issues. The enemy is not each other, it is those who use our differences to exploit us. And, and this is an important tool that we're gonna need for the programs we need. The federal government self finances. What that means is when the federal government spends, it spends by the process of creating new money. They don't have to acquire the money before they spend it, and in fact, they don't. While we have taxes and bond sales, they're never to finance spending for other purposes. So they give the example, Congress passed a bill recently that added $80 billion to the military budget or 700 billion in total. The treasury then by computer marked up the Pentagon's account by that much. These dollars did not exist before the bill passed. The US doesn't need to, and if that cannot tax or borrow in order to spend, they actually spend the dollars into existence by the act of spending. And this is from Sunrise about the Green New Deal. We'll pay for it just as we pay for all else. Congress will authorize necessary spending and treasury will spend. The money that's spent for its part is never raised first. To the contrary, federal spending is what brings the money into existence. And again, just to make sure we're really clear about federal taxes, they, don't fund, they do not fund federal spending. And to be real clear, federal taxes, you pay the taxes, they're actually deleted. The dollars no longer exist. They do not exist. They are not respent later. They do not fund anything. They do not even go to social security. The federal government, remember, spends money into existence. It doesn't need taxes. What it needs is for you to need taxes. For, sorry. The federal government does not need money to spend. It spends the money into existence. It needs you to need the money. And one of the mechanisms of that is the government, the government imposes at the federal level, say taxes. And what the federal government says is once a year, you must pay taxes or they can put you in jail. And the only thing they accept back for taxes is US dollars. So in essence, a US dollar is a tax credit. So the government is basically spending tax credits. You need that money because you need to pay taxes and the government taxes some of it back and it leaves others to remain in circulation. So the money in circulation is actually tax credits that the federal government has not taxed back and deleted. So, and this is important, if the government spends $100 million into the economy and taxes out $100 million, that would be a 100% tax rate and nobody wants that. If they spend $100 million and tax back $30 million, they're leaving $70 million of tax credit out there to circulate as money. And that's money that is the public sector surplus or financial wealth, and it's matched penny for penny by a federal deficit of $70 million. But the federal deficit is simply the money the government spent into the existence, did not borrow, does not have to repay, is no problem for the government. It's simply tax dollars they didn't collect and allow you to use them to run the economy. So the federal deficit, again, it's not money we borrow, it's not money we pay back, it's no burden on our children, despite some mythology we'll talk about, is simply the money supply. So there's no intelligent question about how high the deficit should or shouldn't be. 
The deficit is the mirror image of the money supply. And the question is, is the money supply at the right level to adequately run the economy? That's the only question that should matter. So the question then is, again, to reiterate, the federal deficit is money spent into, into existence by Congress that has not yet been taxed out of circulation. The size of the deficit must be considered relative to what's happening in the economy. So if you have unemployment, underemployment, unmet social needs, like we're not ad addressing the climate change, you can pretty much be guaranteed the federal deficit is too small. And I don't care if it's $20 trillion, that means a $20 trillion money supply is not adequate for the economy in its current state, and we need to spend more. When we are seeing overheated economy with inflation, maybe there's too much money, we can talk about removing at that point, but it's never a question of the size of the deficit is in fact how well is the economy working and does in fact need more money. So the question is of course to balance the economy, not the budget. And in terms of the government spending capacity, there's two concepts I want people to be fluent with. One is fiscal space and one is inflationary offsets. They're two important terms and we need to understand them. Fiscal space will be relevant for the job guarantee and social programs and we're gonna talk about that. I'm going to come back to inflationary offsets a little bit later when we talk about the Green New Deal. Now, see, fiscal space is simply the following. It's the space the government can spend the money into that isn't going to cause inflation. So if there are unemployed people, unemployed resources, and unused workplaces, and the government spends money to hire people to go to work in a work environment with resources and build whatever they're going to build, if a good and services is produced that is valuable and wanted by the population they'll buy, the money spent in creating the goods and services will be absorbed later by the production of those goods and services. In other words, if you're spending extra money into the economy and getting more goods and services, those goods and services will absorb the money. We're taught that inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. But when you have fiscal space, you're introducing more money and creating the same amount of goods and services that balances that money. So the reason it's fiscal space is you can spend into that without causing inflation because you're increasing output at the exact rate. And until you close fiscal space and eliminate unemployment, underemployment, unused resources, you're not going to get inflation. So when you're looking at unemployment at any given time or a recession or a depression, which by definition is fiscal space, the government can fill that space. It doesn't have to do anything other than spend the money into existence. No taxes are used and no inflation is going to occur because you're increasing goods and service in proportion to the money you're spending. And that will be a critical basis for how you fund the federal job guarantee program. Like I said, I'm going to come back to inflationary offsets when we talk about the Green New Deal. Just a quick quote from Stephanie Kelton. There are plenty of problems to solve climate, poverty, homelessness, student debt, college affordability, wage stagnation, opiate epidemic, extreme inequalities. The national debt is not a problem that needs solving. Stop reinforcing that nonsense. This is a slide about what is called sectorial balances. And it kind of makes the point pretty well, I think. So we're gonna focus more on the left-hand side of the screen. The green has to do with the foreign sector and we're not gonna talk about that tonight. But if you look over here, the red is the federal deficit and the blue is the private sector surplus. And as you would expect in a year where there is a high federal deficit, there's exactly a corresponding increase in the national wealth. So if the federal deficit is $20 trillion cumulatively, there's $20 trillion in national wealth. That's total, not for one year. But if the federal deficit is slow one year, then the national surplus is gonna be proportionally low the next year. So again, the question is not the deficit. This is not money we borrow and ever have to pay back or ever poses a burden on our children. This is money the government created freely on its keyboards and chooses not to tax back and then functions as the money supply. And the question is, is the money supply appropriate for the economy? And that's the only question. All this mythology about this being a burden on our children is simply not true. This is money that the government creates on its keyboards, chooses not to delete, and it never has to pay it back. And if you really want to balance the deficit, all you have to do is tax all this money back and delete it and the economy would collapse. No one would want that. And in fact, when Clinton ran a budget surplus, the rest of the private sector went into deficit. And that was a major lead up to 2008. And to be clear, the private sector can only function if it's in surplus. 
which means by definition, the federal government always must be in deficit. There's no way that that isn't true. This private sector surplus is matched by the government's deficit. And since the private sector has to be in surplus, uh, the federal government has to be in deficit and it's completely harmless to them. They simply create the money at will. And again, it's not paid back. So why is there talk about lowering the deficit? Well, there are certain predatory interests at play here. If the government is not creating an adequate money supply and the economy is not running at full speed, it does lead to unemployment and that does lead to lower wages. And it opens the door for parasitic financial practices. So let's turn to our next slide and note that the federal government creates money and banks create debt. What that means is the government spends the money into existence and that's that. The, Fed, the banks like to loan money that you have to pay back with interest. If there's an adequate money supply to run the, co the economy fully, there's much less need for people or city governments, whatever, to take on debt. So it's in Wall Street's interest to have the deficit too low, meaning the money supply too low, so people are more dependent on bank debt and interest, which is completely unnecessary. So for example, if everybody had a living wage, the payday loans people would be out of business. And if the goal is to have unnecessary lending and then later privatization, it's very much to a predatory financial model to be running too low a money supply because that creates the opportunity for privatization and unnecessary bank debt. So again, when we're talking about the federal deficit, we're talking about the money supply. And the issue is if not enough money is being spent to run the economy at full capacity, what you're gonna have is social decay, unemployment, people dying in the street, and we don't address climate change. And that is the only thing that we're gonna burden our children with. And that's simply mitigated by the appropriate spending now. You always have to know that when you're hearing misinformation like this, there's usually a corporate interest at play spreading the misinformation through the corporate media and to corporate candidates. And I know what you're probably thinking. The corporations not telling us the truth, corporate media not telling us the truth, and corporate politicians not telling us the truth. I mean, when did that start happening? But again, not adequately spending now to solve problems is where we create the deficit that really matters for our children, such as climate change. Now, I like to believe that with the appropriate social programs, we can get realignment where the red states flip blue. And I don't mean Nancy Pelosi blue, I mean Bernie Sanders, AOC blue. And actually the blue state should also flip from Pelosi blue to AOC blue. But if we don't do that, we're gonna see a different red and blue state situation where Washington, Oregon, and California will be the new red states and Florida and the Gulf states will be the new blue states because the red states will be on fire and the blue states will be underwater. People naturally are concerned that we need a Green New Deal. And there's a lot of people saying we should do this based on the analogy of the World War II immobilization. And, and that makes sense. And everybody seems very clear that the way we finance World War II was the federal government collected money through taxes or the issuance of war bonds, which financed the war. And everybody knows this and they're very, very entrenched in that belief. Uh, Stephanie Kelton likes to quote Mark Twain that what gets you in trouble is not what you don't know, but what you know for sure, but it ain't so. And while we can argue about that, it's not actually necessary. One of the major architects of that World War II mobilization was actually Keynes. And he actually wrote a book called How to Pay for the War. So it's actually not that difficult to find out what happened. And remember, this is the depression where nobody had any money you could tax and people really didn't have any money they can buy bonds with. But you had huge fiscal space because that's what a depression is. So the federal government actually spent the money into existence to hire people to make the munitions for the war effort. They literally did not tax anybody. They did not issue any bonds for those purposes. They simply spent the money into existence. And what the government typically does is spends money into existence rearrange resources and manages inflation. In the case of World War II, by rearranging resources, Detroit for two years made no new cars. They did 24 hours round the clock military vehicles. They stopped making new homes and they stopped making a lot of consumer goods and took all those raw materials and transferred them to production of war goods. 
Now, the problem is that actually creates a situation for inflation. And the reason for that is I told you that if you spend money and creates goods and services that then absorb the money, you're not going to see inflation. But during the peak years of the war, 50% of GDP went to military spending. And you don't see people pushing their shopping cart in the store and stockpile it with tanks and machine guns and aircraft carriers. So the output was not something that was going to absorb the, the money they were paying the workers. And moreover, there weren't new houses, there weren't new cars. So if people went to buy things, it was going to be required to bid up the price of old houses, bid up the price of old cars, and that was going to be inflationary. So in that situation, the government had to manage the inflation. And there were really four options that I can see. One is tolerate the inflation, but that wasn't a good idea. Another one, which I'm just mentioning tongue in cheek is transition production of consumer goods. In other words, make less tanks and make more cars, which would have helped to some degree with the inflation problem, but would have been a real problem with the beat the Nazis issue. So no one wanted to go that way. Another way is taxes, but understand what we're saying here. The government is going to continue to spend money into existence. The problem is they're paying the workers good money when there's nothing for the workers to buy, and that can cause inflation. So you could tax the workers, not because you needed the money, but to take it away from them and destroy it so they didn't spend it in an inflationary manner. If they had just put their income in the bank and left it there, it wouldn't have been a problem. But if they want to go off and buy used cars and used houses and start bidding the prices up, that would be inflationary. So what the government could do is pay them, for example, $10 an hour, but then tax them $8 an hour right away. So you're only pretending to pay them $10 an hour, you're paying them $2 an hour or whatever actually it was which is not popular. It would help with the inflation problem, but it creates a getting reelected problem. So the solution was to sell war bonds and it works as follows. Like the taxes, the money used to pay the taxes or buy the bonds was the money in the workers' hands because the government had spent the money into existence. So when the government say issues bonds, people buy the bonds with the money that was put in their hands by the government spending to existence. So it was government spending that financed the bond sales. And what the government was simply saying is, we can either tax you or you can buy a bond. If you buy a bond, we take your money that we paid you, we put it here and we're never gonna spend a penny of it and we're gonna give you this bond. And when the war is over, we're gonna give your money back in exchange for that bond and we're gonna spend some interest into existence. So your choices are take the money and let us destroy it or give us the money, we're not gonna spend it on the war or anything, We'll return to you after the war when we're making houses and cars, we'll give you interest and then you can go shopping. So that's how they managed the inflation. And the reason inflation was a problem was what they were making was largely military outputs. Hopefully that made sense. Now, as an MMT person, what we always say is federal taxes don't fund spending or federal taxes are not a source of revenue. At the federal level, federal taxes are not a source of revenue. Well, the person who ran the New York Fed, um, Beardsley Rumi, who was the one who mostly ran this program in the United States, would probably know exactly how it happened since he basically ran it. And he had the famous quote in 1943 that federal taxes for revenue are obsolete. The government spends the money into existence, rearranges resources, and manages inflation. And that's how money works. And that is, in fact, the model for the Green New Deal. Now, as we approach the Green New Deal, where do we start? Well, with good jobs and social programs. We're gonna need good jobs for several reasons. And I'm gonna talk about two social programs that are actually relevant to the Green New Deal and have some important points. But the first thing we need is a federal job guarantee. And there's several reasons for that. One, with the recession looming, we really wanna stop the bleeding. We want people to be able to have the necessary jobs they need to survive. And at this point, the federal government can provide them because there's fiscal space without concern of inflation. Two, it sets a floor. If the federal job guarantees anybody who wants a job can have a job, let's say at $18 an hour, with a 40 hour work week with benefits and humane working conditions, then the rest of the private sector has to match those terms or they can't recruit workers. No one's going to leave the federal job program and go back to the private sector for anything less than that, because you don't have to. So this sense of flexible hours or no benefits, 
they can offer them, but no one's going to want it. This sets a minimum wage for wage benefits, working condition, and hours for the rest of the country. Three, it's counter cyclical, meaning if there is a bit of a recession, maybe a particular person loses their job, now the family suffers. And then what happens is they can't buy from my boss. So my boss now lays me off. Now my family suffers. And now I can't buy from your place of business. So suddenly you're going to get laid off and it starts to snowball. With the federal jobs program, you put these guys right into a job right out of the way. So their family is protected. They can maintain a decent standard of living and they can continue buying what they were buying before. So it doesn't snowball into a big recession. It doesn't cost anybody anything. And we're all happy to see that family be okay. And it makes our job secure in the process. During the initial transaction, the new plan is for people working in fossil fuels to be paid at their current wages as they trans um, their skills and learn to work in the green economy. So in terms of labor and union, their support because the plan will be to pay them at their current wages as they transition to green jobs and green energy. So that's very helpful politically. Um, the other thing is in terms of political alignment where, where these jobs are so critically important, having a progressive movement to provide those jobs should provide a lot of realignment in the country because these are the jobs are dependent on. If it comes to us from people like Cory Bush and people in the squad, you know that, that helps build that movement rather considerably. With respect to the jobs themselves, for people who are qualified to do it, one source of jobs will be childcare and after school care, which is important. It also means childcare becomes free. It also means if you've been in prison and you can't get a job or you're leaving an abusive relationship and your work before financially dependent, you can quickly get a job, be paid for the training, develop a good job record, and if you want, move on to better paying jobs in the private sector. And of course, a lot of the jobs are going to be around green economy, so we're going to definitely want weatherization of houses, planting trees, community gardens. Also, local media, if you're a very good person, for example, advocating for anti-racism work and you're very effective, you know, that may well be a, a paid job as well. So these are going to be paid for by the federal government. Remember, we have fiscal space, so it's not an issue. And the grants go to the local communities to decide where they most want to, where they most need the jobs. Good news, support for the job guarantee pre-COVID was actually the most popular program in the United States. Uh, there's almost really no state where there isn't support for it, and particularly in what we might call the red states. And I would venture, if people understood we can do this without raising their taxes, this support would look a lot stronger. Um, here's a slide on support for the Green New Deal. Six states not in favor, but everybody else at least some degree of support for the Green New Deal. And why it's not stronger, there may be a hint here. Um, this, this, this state is, this slide is from Washington state, but it seems to march out across the country. It's support for various programs. Fado likes to use this slide in Ohio, and he points out that there's 70% support for clean drinking water, 70%. And he always asks his audience, do you know 30% of your friends who don't want clean drinking water? And it's not that anybody doesn't want it. People are working two jobs. They can't handle one more expense. And if their taxes are gonna be raised to pay for this, that's a very scary thought for them. Their other concern is if you tax their employer, the employer may go under and they may lose their job. So the issue is not that everybody doesn't want all of these things, it's the pay for question. And if it could be explained to people that this can all be done with public money and no increase of their taxes, I would guess every one of these things shifts all the way over and this map looks a lot darker. A um, few comments about Medicare, and the reason I want to talk about Medicare is one, we clearly need this in the coming recession and beyond. Also, as it turns out, Medicare for all is the major way we're going to pay for the Green New Deal. So just to mention, Rokahana, the new Medicare for all bill is comprehensive because it includes vision, dental, prescription drugs, substance abuse, maternal care, and universal coverage for long-term care, no co-pays, no deductibles, and no medical bankruptcies. Now, in terms of the pay for here, when someone says that Medicare for all costs $32 trillion, we should mention our current system costs $49 trillion. You really got to admire the chutzpah of corporate propagandists who have managed to convince the country that we could never afford $32 trillion in a very workable system, but a $49 trillion system with all the holes in it 
easy to afford. And you kind of wonder if there isn't some corporate interest in you know, pharmaceutical and health insurance that may be leading to this misinformation, very analogously to where the banks, the Wall Street banks have a lot of misinformation on the federal deficit. And they also want to argue the deficit is a reason, of course, to privatize or at least eliminate Social Security, Medicare, and things like that, when there's absolutely no basis for that. And speaking of um, Social Security, people still need to retire even if it's a recession. And one of the things we're told is Social Security is going to go broke. Your taxes don't actually go to Social Security, and that's not how it's paid for. It's paid off general account like everything else, including the military. So we can actually strengthen this, make it more generous. It's also a way for emergency payments that people could have, say, during the pandemic. The infrastructure is there, so it's one way to get people money when they need it. But the notion that it's going to go broke is based on the notion that we haven't prepaid for it. And it's even worse than that. So if your job is eliminated by automation or outsourcing, or you worked in a store and you went out of business thanks to Amazon, you don't have a job and you're not making payments to Social Security, so you don't deserve much of anything when you retire. You only get what you prepaid for, you personally. That's not the way the country works. So for example, when Wall Street had their major collapse in 2008, the people responsible, now I didn't go to jail, but Wall Street got a $30 trillion bailout. Does anybody recall the time that Wall Street prepaid for that bailout? Does anybody recall the time that the Pentagon and the arms dealers ever prepaid for a war or billionaires ever prepaid for a tax cut? When was the last time the oil companies prepaid for their subsidies, which includes the wars? Now, when I say they don't prepay, that's not entirely true. There is some degree of prepayment, but that's technically called campaign contributions. But other than that, the government spends the money, rearranges the resources, and manages inflation. And it's very easy to very much make Social Security much, much more generous. So when people talk to you about Social Security or Medicaid or Medicaid becoming insolvent, I have a quote from a friend of mine that I think really sums it up very well. And this is great with scary music in the background. The federal military budget is set to go broke in 2025, said no Congress ever. And remember, social programs are paid out of general account, just like the military budget. It's a political choice. What they want to do is use the deficit to make you believe that it's going to go broke so they can privatize it. But there's absolutely no basis, in fact, where that should be. So we need to deal with a Green New Deal because of climate collapse. And therefore, we need to see this as the moral equivalent of war in the two crises of climate change and economic emergency. And we want to address inequality, racism, environmental justice, and just economic transition. Now, with respect to the Green New Deal that we need, we've already filled fiscal space with the job guarantee, and that's still not going to cover the Green New Deal. So the numbers that I've seen in the studies I've read, and they're pre-COVID, so there may be slight adjustments, are as follows. To do what we need to do and do it right for the Green New Deal in the United States and the Global South, it's going to cost us 5% of GDP for the next 10 years. Remember, World War II was up to 50% of GDP, though GDP is bigger now, but it's 5% of GDP per year for the next 10 years. Now, that is potentially going to be inflation because we filled fiscal space. But if you look at the economy, some things are inflationary and some things are deflationary. If they're in balance, you're not going to see inflation. So if you're going to do something that's inflationary, but you can do something that matches it that is deflationary, you're not going to have inflationary. And these are inflationary offsets, what I talked about earlier. And how we can pay for the Green New Deal is with inflationary offsets. And interestingly, if you look at where the inflation is in our economy, it's in areas that are monopolistic, price gouging, and greatly harm people. So if you fix that and actually help people, it's actually going to be deflationary and would balance the Green New Deal. So where is the inflation coming from? Well, healthcare, education, housing, energy transportation, and maybe a little Wall Street um, speculation, but we'll leave that one out for the moment. So healthcare. Our current healthcare system consumes 18% of GDP. The much more generous and complete Medicare for all I mentioned earlier is 14.5% of GDP. 
that's a 3.5% decrease in GDP. Stephanie Kelton, in one of my favorite talks of hers, took place in, I think, the best conference I've seen on the Green New Deal that was sponsored by Boston Sunrise, whole series of talks to the day, including Pharma. And Stephanie pointed out that to pay for the Green New Deal, we have to find 5% deflation in the U.S. economy. And since Medicare for all, which benefits most of the population, would be a 3.5% decrease, with Medicare for all, as she put it, you're more than halfway there. Then you throw in education, housing, and energy, and you've got your 5%. With respect to housing, the job guarantee helps here as well. Because if you lose your job in the Midwest and there's no jobs there, you're forced, unfortunately, to have to leave your community, possibly your family, and move to the coast where you might be able to find a job doing, say, computer work. Um, where you're then going to have to move in where the housing is expensive. And with this influx of people, it just drives the price of housing higher. If people can get jobs in their own community where they want to be with their families, that would at least partially offload the expense on housing. And there's other policies we can do to bring housing costs down. But the critical point to note, and this matters, is by improving healthcare, making education essentially free, bringing housing costs down to reasonable things, and with the transition off carbon, making energy and transportation less expensive, you free up 5%, you have 5% deflation in the economy and that fully covers the Green New Deal. And if I'm an organizer, I have to like the fact that that's my message. We're not gonna pay for the Green New Deal by taxing you. We're gonna pay for the Green New Deal by making your life a whole lot better. Now, this is a slide from the first talk I ever did on MMT. And I told my audience, we have to have that awkward conversation about where money comes from. And it's not coming from China and we don't, it doesn't come from taxes. And in fact, they don't use your taxes for anything other than to shred it and delete it, doesn't fund spending. And you really had to kind of calm people down and talk them through it. And I said, let's compare and contrast that to the other awkward conversation we have with our children, in our case, our five-year-old, about where babies come from. And our son wanted to know when he was five, so he explained, daddy does this, mommy does that, you have a baby. And his reaction was, sure, that makes perfect sense. And when I tell my audiences, there's two things that no five-year-old ever tells their parent when you explain this to them. One, well, that's kind of what I assumed all along. And no five-year-old has the foresight to say to their parents, you know, that seems just a little too good to be true. But if you understand modern money, that's how you pay for the Green New Deal. This is the former head of staff of AOC. And unfortunately, I can't read that because it's blocked for me, but the Green New Deal will be funded as all other ambitious American projects from public works to public bail, bank ballots and from wars to tax cuts have been through carefully targeted congressionally authorized spending. As the post 2008 consensus among serious economists and financiers affirms, this does not require new taxes unless inflation emerges. So you spend the money, if you first you fill fiscal space, then you do all the inflationary offsets, and then you take maybe resources that are being wasted in military and things like that, convert them to civilian goods. And by the time you've gone through all of that, and you might be seeing some degree of inflation, we're in a very, very different place than where we are. And in fact, that actually wouldn't be such a bad problem to have. And again, easily handled. So back to where we started, we can use public money without a tax increase to deal with the unemployment and healthcare and retirement issues of the recession, which also addresses hopefully minimizing this right-wing radicalization that's clearly gonna happen if we don't handle this right quickly. Hopefully achieve political realignment, which means we can go from there to a lot of other things that are important. But even before we start that process, we've created the inflationary offsets to take care of the climate change now. So that's how we can handle all this in one fell swoop. So what about taxes? I, this is Stephanie Kelton. If I hadn't already found my soulmate, we do not need, this is somebody else's tweet that she's reposting. We do not need to tax rich people in order to fund public spending and the renewable transition. We can issue sovereign currency to do that. We need to tax rich people to reduce excess resource and energy use and because inequality is corrosive to society and democracy. Now, we don't have the political strength to do this now. And the problem the left runs into is 
if we don't have access to taxes, we can't get the social programs. If we don't have the social programs, we can't generate a progressive movement that's going anywhere. So we just spin our wheels, spin our wheels. But MMT is very clear. We can use our sovereign currency to address all the issues I've discussed, build political realignment. And at that point, we can come back for taxes for these reasons, but we don't have to be sitting around spinning our wheels. This comes later. We don't need their money to accomplish the goals that we need to accomplish and need to accomplish urgently. AOC had the, the tweet, let's make a deal. Until team, let's make a space force, build child concentration camps and give $2 trillion to the rich, explain how they finance their mass cruelty. They haven't earned the right to ask how we pay for people's health care. She was on TV being interviewed and someone asked her how she would pay for the Green New Deal. And she said, we'll pay for it the way you pay for everything else. Wars, bailouts, whatever. And the conversation stopped on the dime. I don't think they want the public to understand how this works. You remember this interesting moment when this senator is meeting these brave and heroic children and they're asking about the Green New Deal and she blows them off like, well, how are you going to pay for it? A question she never asked about wars, bills, or anything else. And all but tells the kids, come back when you've got acquired the taxes. Reminds me of a scene from a movie where there was this horrible grifter who called himself a wizard. And he told young Dorothy and her friends, because he didn't want to respond to their demands, they should go out and bring him the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West. Now, he didn't actually need the Wicked which is broomstick any more than she needs taxes. And if you were paying attention in the movie, what he was really doing was deliberately sending Dorothy and her friends in their movement on what he assumed would be a suicide mission. He was sending them off to be killed. And unfortunately, Dorothy did not understand that. Now, we won't have script writers giving us magic buckets of water. So it's important when we hear something like this, we need to understand what we're being confronted with. This is a person without any integrity because this is not the way we handle anything but social programs. And that's not how they're funded. Now, personally, when I hear somebody say that, I hear a cry for help. I hear what she's really saying is, I'm really old. I've been at this for way too long. And for the love of God, can somebody primary me? Now, this is the first crop of the brand new Congress candidates who ran as Bernie style Democrats against corporate people trying to um, out primary them and go on to winning the election. And only AOC got through in that first batch. Since then on this picture, uh, Cory Bush got through, which is gonna be really exciting. And my thinking at the time was, I mean, their platform was the job guarantee, free college, Medicare for all, the Green New Deal. And it's not that people didn't want those things. The question was to pay for it. Like, yeah, I want that, but how are you gonna do it? And I can't afford to raise my taxes. Um, and I really feel if the people understood how you can use public money to fully fund all this without costing them a penny, I would think they all could have gotten through. Now, I, I do wanna give a call out to a local hero. This is Sarah Smith, who ran a real, A, she's a great person, and B, ran a really good campaign. Came up a bit short, but still a great campaign. And I was, actually in the office one night talking to her husband, Jay, who was her campaign manager. And I said, I really wish we could have explained this MMT to the people in your district before she ran, because they think it would have made it easier for her to win. And Jay said, that's not a bad idea, but it'd be key if we can do this on a national level. Uh, a short time later, Troy Hewitt, who I had met in the Sarah Smith campaign, told me that I was being invited to speak at the summit of brand new Congress to teach the candidates MMT. And, and I said, you really don't want me. You want Stephanie Kelton or Faddle um, Kaboob. You, you don't want me. And Troy's like, no, no, we want you. And this went back and forth for a bit. And I said, fine, I'll be very happy to go, uh, but I'm gonna bring some friends. So, and it turned out there wasn't enough time. So I wound up having to give my time to Faddle, which was fine. Um, this is Andreas Bernal. He was actually a friend of AOC before she ran, and he taught her MMT and introduced her to the MMT people who actually did the legislation for the Green New Deal. It was, it was written by MMT economists. And the gentleman next to me is Fala Kaboob, who is one of the most important economists in the country. And I'm just here, but proudly wearing my Sarah Smith shirt. And when Fala explained all this to the candidates, like this pay for thing is not pie in the sky, it's very practical. 
And in fact, we don't have to tax one person to pay for the other. So we're not fighting over a crumb and it's not pie. We can fully expand this for everybody. Eyes were popping open. People were taking pictures of every slide. It was, it was actually a really exciting moment to watch. I actually made eye contact with Corey Bush, who I've always really admired. And we shared a big smile. It was kind of a fun moment. I'm sure she's forgotten and I'll never forget it. But everybody asked for Fadl's card and he wound up advising just about the whole bunch of them. And he told me later that he thought the history of MMT changed this weekend. And I really felt like I was sitting here watching history. At this point, him and Stephanie and the others, I think are advising like several hundred, in fact, probably all the progressive candidates running. So the candidates in brand new Congress, they all understand MMT, say you can fund all these programs. The issue is the communities need to understand that. And it would be interesting to me if we can get like our city councils and our state reps to know it and work around all the country to work out together to call out that in fact, not only is it insane to pretend that we have to cut social security or Medicare, we can strengthen them, but we can also run all these programs and we should raise our voices together. You know, we in Seattle support the people of Alabama who needs this program and Flint, Michigan who needs clean water and they support, we need this in South Seattle and we can actually build the movement together and really put pressure on the Congress people that don't have the backbone to do the right thing and their campaign supporters. And in the process, I think we make it very clear that we can all have good things and what's in the way are the corporate candidates in both parties, uh, their campaign contributors, which are the same people for both and that um, it's not each other anymore. And maybe we can even grow up to the point that we don't put responsibility for our problems on one-year-old children. But the bottom line is it makes it very clear what the problem is and we can organize. And the city council and the state reps who are the most informed and successful in explaining this will obviously be the people that we will need to use to primary these people. And in the process, we've built the understanding that we need to start sweeping these people into office and rapidly building the squad, which is clearly what we need to do. Now, some good news. This book by Stephanie Kelton, The Deficit Myth, has been read by a number of congressional people, not just the squad, but more liberal but well-intended people. And as Vonda pointed out, they're meeting with Stephanie on a regular basis. And Fadl said a number of them have said kind of quietly that if we can build the progressive movement and our congressional districts understand this and it's safe for them to talk about it, if it gets to that point, they would like to jump ship and be with us because they now understand that these programs are possible and they would like to run as advocates of them if there's enough understanding for them to do that. So if we can build this up, they seem like they want to jump ship. And I've heard from very reliable people that a lot of the people advising Joe Biden have read this book and were apparently Barack Obama had big reports on his desk where he couldn't do any of these things. Because of this book, those files are not on Biden's desk. He understands actually that he can do these things. And there'll be corporate pushback the other way, but if there's enough of a movement to understand and everyone wants these programs and understands they don't cost us money to get them, I don't know where the pressure can leak, how far we can go with this, but we certainly need to push for this. And Fadl's gonna be talking about this in more detail uh, next week. So clearly important to come back for that. I wanna end with a discussion of taxpayer dollars. There's some points here that we need to understand. So the slide says WTF, what the something, you always say taxpayer dollars. Money is created by Congress, not taxpayers. And remember, the way it works is the federal government spends the money into existence, and that is public money, and it was supposed to be for public purpose. So what the government is supposed to do is look at the resources of the United States and the needs of the majority of the population and spend public money, our money, our money, to allocate those resources in the ways to maximize the public good, which would mean an excellent healthcare system, an excellent school system, that creates kids intentionally that are critical thinkers and more prone to be in solidarity with themselves and other people, respect for themselves, respect for others, appropriate employment, employment, appropriate retirement and recreational facilities, in other words, a healthy, vibrant society. And the way the money is spent also should be spent to maintain more equality of income and wealth. I mean, all this is possible. But what happened is, you know, the corporate people have taken public money and reallocated for themselves, deliberately not funding appropriate public health, 
to create room for the um, pharmaceuticals in the healthcare system, not providing for free college to take advantage of not only student loans, but be able to inf corporate money to influence what's being taught in our schools and so on and so forth. The point of taxes at this level is if the government is running out of space it can spend into, sometimes you take some money out to create money for further spending. The people who have misappropriated that money are now saying when it comes to the offsetting taxes, we'll send that back to the very people that we robbed. Stephen Kelton points out that when you have a federal deficit, that means you've increased the public wealth. The question is, where did it go? What was it used for and who got it? And while one set of Congresses have gone in one direction, another Congress can go in a very different direction. So if we get through a job guarantee program and start to get political realignment, it's possible to sort of sculpt a society that looks a whole lot different. Now, I do wanna say a few more things about this. There's actually a really interesting paper called The Dangerous Myth of Taxpayer Money by Ruel Cario and Jesse Meyerson. And they point out that by using the phrase taxpayer money, we are actually spreading a racist, sexist, and classist myth. They said one quick exercise shows why. Picture a taxpayer. What does one look like? A homeless black trans teen? An immigrant day labor waiting on the corner? A young mom trying to cobble enough income together to feed her family? Unlikely. Calling it public money, calling public money taxpayer money implicitly affirms that taxation is theft. If the money is taxpayers by right, what business does the government have using it for healthcare jobs or clean water? If we're looking out for taxpayers and not the public as a whole, we are favoring wealthier groups over poorer ones, white people over black, men over women, US born over immigrants and so forth. Not only is the taxpayer myth frame damaging, it doesn't reflect how public spending actually works. The US government is the issuer of the currency. Congress votes to spend new money on something and the Treasury and Federal Reserve credit the relevant bank accounts and that's it. The government has spent new money into existence. Later, Congress may tax old money back out of existence, but it isn't collecting the money to spend, it is offsetting earlier spending. And it ends with my favorite paragraph. There is more than enough housing for the homeless, food for the hungry, and medicine for the sick. And there's enough low carbon emission technology to transform our energy system, quit exacerbating the climate crisis, and hire unemployed people all in one fell swoop. And there is more than enough public money to manage it all. I would really, it, so to summarize, public money and not taxes funds federal spending. Affording the Green New Deal depends on balancing the economy, not the budget and saving the climate and building justice can be accomplished together. And in fact, it's the only way that's gonna be done. Strongly recommend you read the book, The Deficit Myth and consider becoming an mmt -er. There is likely going to be an important announcement about a job guarantee coming out. And it's a really critical thing to organize on and bring pressure on our Congress people that we know how the system works. They know they can fix the problems and that we're gonna hold them accountable if they don't. We're gonna hold their financiers the campaign financials accountable. And we're going to build the process by which they can be effectively uh, primaried out on the next cycle. And, and that's something that can be done with, I think, good organizing and community activity. I don't know where I am on time, but I'll stop here. I want to thank Bill, Amy, Backbone, Vondana, and Fadel for being here next week. And with the time remaining, would like to try to answer any questions. You were talking about the jobs program, the health care creating a strong safety net to improve equality. And I've been doing a lot of work recently on the immigration pressure that we're facing and the fact that we're also talking about global disparity here. And I'm wondering if MMT or any of your conversation also has a strategy for the global disparity. Okay, and then my second question is around the model of donut economics. And it's really clear how you're proposing to get people out of the center of the donut and into an adequate living ability. But I'm wondering about having a maximum planetary capacity and whether or not this takes into account how we don't overextend the demands on the resources. So Again, the plan is to build actually a green sustainable economy. So that, that is the goal. It's not to go back to the old model. 
So okay. we're transitioning to, and actually where, where we want to go with jobs in the future is called the care economy. So what we're doing is the jobs are going to be caring for the, the planet and caring for each other. Okay. So that's that part. As far as the globe, yes, that's a big question. And believe it or not, the person who actually has done tons of work on that is Fadl, so he's worth asking about. But the plan for the Green New Deal does involve helping the global south. And two, you can actually do job guarantees like this in the global south. And there's a lot, you can also address issues of um, reparations using, it's much more affordable and not harmful to people that weren't responsible in this as well. As far as the model for the global south, I can send you stuff if you give me a thing, but follow, I can do like hour long talks on this. So it's gonna be kind of hard to get down in a minute or two. And I think even he will have trouble doing it in a question and answer period. But the simple answer is yes. There's, I mean, there are a lot of us, like he's probably done the most work about how to make this work in the global south. And there's been a lot of conferences in Africa. In fact, it's just a quick dumb story, but his wife was funny. He had just came back from Africa when I called him to go to do the brand new Congress thing. And he said, she said, our son's birthday is tomorrow and you just got back from Africa. What the heck does Randy want you to do? And he said, going to the brand new Congress summit. And she goes, you're going, but be back tomorrow for your son's birthday. And, and he did. But I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'll send you some stuff and try and talk about when I'm not as exhausted as I am right now, but that, that's a long conversation. But yes, the answer is yes, it's been deeply thought out. And the, the idea is to actually help people in that situation as well. Thank you. And, and the other thing too is hitting, uh, we're not gonna talk about this tonight, but hitting anti austerity even in Europe and the United States. One of the things does, it makes it more likely we're gonna take refugees and there's gonna be some refugees. Uh -huh. I mean, we're not that far, we're about a third of North Africa is gonna be, or a chunk of Northern Africa is gonna be uninhabitable about a third of the year. So, but actually in terms of using this for sustainable practices in Africa, I don't know anyone's done better work than FADL. Whether you look at that larger scale global economics or you look at the state, how does MMT um, relate to state budgets? Because states aren't sovereign, uh, what do you call it, a sovereign? Um, sure. So there's, yeah. So a couple of things to say about this. And, and that's, oh, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Get going. No, what is the, how, what's the term for the sovereign? Issue of the, the monopoly issue of the currency. Okay. Sovereign. The federal government issues a dollar, the states don't. So then how do the state, how does your state okay. budget matter anymore? So, so here's the deal. That's an important question. The states, so if people are able, talk about doing the Green New Deal at the state level, it, it doesn't make any sense. But, and this is critical, the federal government can provide those resources to the states. And that's how it has to happen. So the states need to, I think, come together at local and larger levels and really advocate for what we need. The federal government, Stephanie Kelton pointed out in the coming recession, the federal government can safely spend many trillions of dollars in relief, many trillions of dollars. The states can't touch that. So the critical thing is the state has to step in and help out. And that's where the organizing has to reflect that we have to understand that, get our city council and our state people to work together because it's the federal government that has that power. There are things you can do at the state level that are partially helpful. And I can just touch on a few and we can probably have to talk about it later, but the main thing to concentrate right now is you're exactly right. The federal government can provide those that money to the states through block grants. They can do it absolutely. And that's what needs to happen. Okay, thank you. So does that uh, make sense? Well, you're right. The state, the state has limited capacity to handle this. They are actually having to acquire the money to spend it. So at the local level and at the so at the city, state, county level, those taxes do fund spending. That's what I, th I think it was important for my brain to get to get around that because to understand that that dynamic. Let me just make one more comment on what you just said. Yeah. When the federal government deliberately doesn't come there for the states, they're deliberately setting the states up for financial troubles, and then of course privatizing state resources by the banks. I mean, they are deliberately setting them up to be taken advantage by the financial sector. So when you hear people like Mitch McConnell complaining that they don't want to send money to the states, it's because they're setting them up to be ripped off. And again, people need to understand that and act accordingly. Yeah, and I'm sure there must be some kind of relationship between that and like things like state banks and such, but we're not gonna go there. But Frank Lee, you are unmuted and you are next. Uh, okay, um, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, when the government is spending, let's say before it spends, 
is there some way that a policymaker can determine how inflationary any proposed piece of spending will be? Yeah, like, so what right, would you look at? Yeah, so right now when the federal, when the Congress is going to make a bill, there is the um, Congressional Budget. Accounting Budget Office that right now measures the impact on the deficit. But they can also do the study to look at inflationary impacts and inflationary offset. That, that's something that can be done. And Stephanie Kelton has been working with them to advocate for that. But that could very well be done. And that's what they should be doing. So instead of the, the accounting business, look up congressional budget the, the Congressional Budget Office, instead of looking at impacts on deficit, they can do the work to look at the impact on inflation and how you'd offset it. Oh, okay. So like uh, if you're going to have free college, for example, then you have to make sure that there are enough seats at colleges and enough professors, et cetera. So, so, th so they would have to do the legwork to find all that out. Yep. Okay. That's really great. Thank you, Frank. That was a really interesting question. Thank you. Oh, and uh, first, Art, would you like to ask? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's estimated that there are about $30 trillion now uh, held in offshore bank accounts uh, as uh, used as tax havens, et cetera, um, by the wealthy. Has there been any discussion about how we might repatriate some of that money to help pay for programs? Um, or is does that, uh, with MMT, is that something we just want to give them a pass on? Well, I mean, first of all, you don't need that money to fund programs, and you're not going to get that money to fund programs. Taxes are deleted. Um, you'd obviously, if those taxes come up, like I said, you want to delete them because you want to break their power. But I mean, that's a complicated question. I'm not the best person for it. But the bottom line is you don't need that money for taxes. So no one's saying that we want to give a lot of things a break. What you want to do is if you want to start, I mean, unraveling the Wall Street and the offshore banking is going to be something that's going to require some international cooperation. Mm -hmm. First thing I would say is this. You're not even going to be able to touch that problem until the squad is like the majority of the House, the majority of the Senate in, in, in the White House. And at that point, the people are the big experts can handle this. So we'll let Stephanie Kelton and Fottle and Bob Hawk and all the guys handle that. The point, though, is for any of that to happen, the squad has to be in the majority. And the way they're going to get in the majority is not us having to worry about those questions. It's the job guarantee. It's the Medicare. Because that's how you get the realignment to let those guys handle the problem. So, so you're I'm saying you're lifting the bottom rather than pulling down the top in a way? Like well, you, the first, so first of all, you can lift the bottom from what we discussed today. And then you get the political realignment where then you can let people like Bob Hawkins and Bill Black and Stephanie Kelton go to work. But we, we need to do that for a lot of reasons, not to fund the programs. But the financialization piece is a big deal and you want to break the power of the banks for a lot of reasons. But I think what someone once said is we can actually address income inequality, reparations, jobs, healthcare, this, that, that, and the Green New Deal before we have to crack open the hand of Wall Street. And if you make the squad the majority and people are aware and, you, and people are not blaming each other, but a pull together, then you're in a position to break open the hand of Wall Street. So what I would see is a chess game. And the final part of it where you actually get down to those critical policies if you're not a top-notch expert and completely up to date, you're not going to know it. And they're not going to write books about what they're going to do because it's just going to tell the other side. So we're not going to have to know that, but we have to build the political capacity for that to happen. So we can address all the programs I discussed. We don't need any of that money. And if that allows us to come together, build the squad, et cetera, then they can hand it off to Stephanie Kelton and all those guys who handle those problems. And that's fantastic. But our job is not only to stop the bleeding prevent the right wing, the radicalization on and on and on is to build a political movement that makes the squad the majority force. And then then Stephanie Kelton and Bob Hawkins and Bill Black and all those guys can go to work and let them do it. But our job is to build the basis for that to happen. And that's through the programs we discussed and, and that we can do. And we don't need any of that money or any of that to be in place to do that first. Ed, go ahead. I had a follow-up about the monetary sovereignty of the states. If uh, the uh, states, uh, like the state of Washington, could start its own uh, state bank, well then, 
uh, then the state would get some monetary sovereignty, right? No, it can't. I mean, it's the, first of all, first of all, the states can't actually run deficits, and the states do not have the capacity to issue a sovereign currency. It's, I mean, a state bank can do some things, right? So, state bank, for example, if Seattle wants to divest and needs to put the money somewhere, and the other banks wouldn't take it, then they can put their money in state bank. The state bank allows the state to make some interest off that bank. And it may mean they'll loan money that for a project the other banks wouldn't. Let's suppose you want to do a people of color run co-op to build solar panels, pick that up. And Bank of America says, the hell, we're not going to fund that. A state bank might, and it might offer that loan at a very low interest rate. So that's better than we are. But remember, the federal government can simply say, here's grants worth several trillion dollars to do that. You don't borrow it, you're not going to pay it back. I mean, the scope of that is off the charts higher than any state bank can do. So I'm not opposed to a state bank, but look at it this way. If someone's house catches fire, they want a fire truck to come to them right away, not really good friends with a bucket of water. The, the, what it's going to take to get us out of the situation is the sovereign currency of the United States. I mean, the World War II mobilization could never have done with state banks. It could never have done at the state level. Only the federal government could do the policies, rearrange the resources, manage the economy, and create the money it took to fund that. There just isn't another option. So I'm not opposed to state banks. I don't know anybody who is, but they, they, they just don't have that much punch. And again, nothing against them. Right. But it's a leverage and the money has to eventually be paid back. And that's different uh, than what, what you're talking right, about. But the federal government can create the money and spend into existence. That There's very limited capacity for any state to even come close to that. So they just don't have that capacity. If the major political problem is the question, how do you pay for it? And how do you, so, and, and, and then the conversation stops. What if the treasury, somebody said, well, the treasury is going to mint a hundred trillion dollar coin and put it in its account, its bank account at the federal reserve. And then Congress, through its appropriations um, as appropriate democracy, uh, figures out what they wanna buy, what they wanna spend. So there isn't any of this uh, question about printing money out of thin air. You've minted this coin, it's a hundred trillion dollars and it sits, it sits in a bank account like a savings account and the, and the federal government, the Congress draws on it. They could do the same thing with social security with the bonds that are in the social security account, uh, trust fund, uh, and just raise the interest rates to cover any shortages or expand benefits. So the government pays social security out of general account. They can simply pay it out of general account. They don't have to do any of that stuff for social security. But the, it's the political question. It's the political question yeah. to get around that, to get around that, just say, hey, the bonds that are sitting on the spreadsheet now earn 25% uh, uh, interest. I mean, or you... the coin, just the treasury puts it in, in its account at the, uh, at the Fed, and then the, uh, the Congress draws on it. Uh, Bruce, I just wonder if that actually perpetuates the myth that we're trying to get out of, and just it, if that, Randy, yeah. <laughs> no, no. I mean, with, with this idea of the minting the trillion dollar coin, hundred trillion dollar coin. Oh, that's actually been proposed by people within MMT. I mean, the bottom line is this. I mean, you can go different ways to do this, but the federal government authorizes spending and then the treasury and federally can spend it. And actually Rohan and Raul and others actually were offering this idea of minting the coin. There you go. Um, that gets a little more complicated and you can ask Fadel about it, but you're right. The bottom line is the government there's a lot of tricky mechanisms how this the works out in terms of the machinery of the Fed and, and um, the Treasury. But the bottom line is it all begins when the Congress authorizes the spending. Okay. And Social Thank Security you. can just be, I mean, authorized. You don't have to go through a lot of those games. Uh, Gene, uh, would you like to ask? Hey, Randy, thanks so much. You answered a few more of my, my burning questions. Um, I get that we need to change the balance in Congress. I'm not asking anybody to to support any candidate at this point. Uh, I don't know who. So I'm just wondering about the, is there organizing around uh, how to identify the people that we want to support uh, that understand MMT and that are running against some of the corporate candidates 
that we don't want in there because they're doing more harm than good. Well, I mean, there's organizations like Brand New Congress and Justice Democrats that are recruiting candidates. Mm -hmm. And there's some other independent candidates. Um, there were like several hundred last time. And I think, like I said, staff being bottle and a couple others were like probably the, advising all of them. Mm -hmm. So I think I think the key places of the organizations, I mean, that are really strong in putting out these candidates and brand new Congress and Justice Democrats are two that come to mind. So you think that's a safe group to that knows what they're doing? And we well, I mean, that's where it started. Like AOC came out of brand new Congress and Justice Democrats. Okay. So did Cory Bush, um, Jamal Bowman. So a lot of these guys are coming in. They're, they're the big groups. Now there's other people running as well. And mm -hmm. we have people in our state who were not on either affiliation, who were very MMT and very strong that way. So it's out there, but I think they're at this point, I think they are all reaching out to Fado and Stephanie for help. And Fado's, but I mean, I do not know how he does it, but he was probably advising almost all of them. I the you watch him, he's on TV around the country with all these candidates doing programs in their state. So that's how you find them. But I think the major groups right now are brand new Congress and Justice Democrats. Great, thank you. Uh, the, the other piece of this is we need to, uh, to inform our uh, state and local can, uh, electeds to yeah, really no, I, understand this as well, because they're they're going to they're essential to implementing the the programs. They have well, to understand this, right? But like I said, I I would love to see the city councils around the country come together and raise their voices. That we know that you're starving us. We know why you're starving us, and what the consequences are. And we know darn well you can fix the problem, mm -hmm. and really make sure that their communities know that. So they're putting pressure on their representatives and that we're building an awareness that allows, so for example, let's say one of our best city council people, I can think of someone I'd love to see do this, who's out there really explaining this, advocating app and really understands the cold. Uh, they'd be the perfect person to um, primary somebody. Meanwhile, you've got the communities who now understand it, are in a position to put that pressure or move in a new direction. But also remember, you've got a lot of people that actually want to jump over if there was enough support for that. So. These are probably good questions for Fado, but I mean, I think it's definitely happening. The question is, is it gonna happen fast enough? And certainly we have to do it fast enough so we don't go further to the right. Because if we don't deliver soon, we got a problem. But um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. By the way, it's good to see you. Very good to see you, Randy. That's great, thank you, Gene. All right, Leo, are you able to ask your, ask your question? Yeah. Right on. Hi, Rand Hi, Randy. Thank you for the program. How you doing? Good. Thank you. A quick question, I think. Just thumbs up or thumbs down. Do you uh, think the National Infrastructure Bank Act, yes, pass, no? It, will it make a difference um, for, for public programs, for big, you know, I mean, for the big, the big capital projects? So I'm not quite sure what you're asking, but there's been, a, so you should look up, Bob Hockett has this thing called, um, expand the Fed or no, that's not what it's called. It is, let me think in a second. But what he's basically saying is the Federal Bank, Federal Reserve used to be a development bank so that we can actually use, so again, the money that the government will create can go through um, the Federal Reserve to, to do this large scale, spread the Fed so that we can actually, A, we can bank at the Fed and get money in terms of recovery, but also that you can use that bank to administer the funds the federal government spent into existence to administer large scale infrastructure programs. So the person you look at is Bob Hawkins. And he's got a book um, called Money for Nothing that I would really recommend getting. And then you can Google his articles on Spread the Fed. And he's got a lot of the information there. And if that's not what you need, reach out to me and I'll give you more. Thank you. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lael. Uh, Carol. Here in Seattle or in the yeah, Northwest, we do a lot about um, the bank, the state bank. Has the have the state bank people reached out to you or you to them? Um, they seem like a natural ally. If you, you know, if they understood this, I'm. They feel like the kind of people that would understand this or want to understand this, and that would make a larger group to go to city council people to talk about this. Yeah, um, we kind of did do that to a bit, but I think some of the state bank people are really focused on the state bank, and that's a positive thing. But but then again. MMT is something different and oh, yeah. <laughs> it just didn't quite click for some reason. It might, it might later, but I mean, I understand why a state bank and I think it does offer a lot of advantages, but I would still read what I said before. If you're looking at the urgency of the Green New Deal and the social programs that we need, 
a state bank is really not going to be able up to deliver that in time. It really does have to come from MMT and, and the sovereign currency. Like I said, we couldn't have done the World War II mobilization on state banks and not speaking against them. It's just, I think people go to things they really are interested in and that's where they go and that's fine too. But yeah, I, you would have thought so. And it, it still could be the case later. But I think when people pour their heart into something and they care about it and they're great people and, and it's a good cause, that's it's a little bit different situation but a state bank as good as it is is still very different than mmt although that may be a place where the federal block grants can go to be a minister that's that's really the case too right that's an interesting idea and be interesting to have uh bob hasagala um uh think about that as a possibility i do have a question in regards to a little pet project of mine and uh something that's emergent is would the purchase, say, of the federal government, say the federal government wants to harmonize the, the infrastructure, get all these new um, um, rights of way for, um, for electric, for the national supergrid, and, um, and it wants to expand rail and it can't wait for the private industry to do it. So say it wants to like buy uh, 47,000 miles of class one railroad, interstate railroad to harmonize with the National High and Federal Highway Administration. Um, would that be an inflationary or an or a non-inflationary app? Do or is that even the right question? Is this the kind of thing that um, MMT would allow? So first of all, is I don't know the legality of that in terms of you know the laws around all that. But as far as straight MMT, I mean, with the fiscal space we have right now, it's it's hard to see anything being inflationary. Actually, one of the things Bob Hawkett was talking about, what the government can even do is it could take fossil fuel infrastructure plants, put it on the government's books and swap out brand new, you know, clean energy books. And it's not going to be inflationary. So you've got all the fiscal space in the world right now to do that kind of thing. So I, you can ask FODL, but I doubt it's going to be inflationary. Uh, it's a great idea. And it would seem like an offer, one thing that, you know, you could use public money for. But I don't know the rules about what you can and can't do in terms of that kind of thing, in terms of the legal thing, but economically, I don't see a problem. And I mean, I don't think we're in a position where inflation is likely to be a problem. Yeah. I mean, we're a lot- Most of the class one railroads risk. are publicly traded, so they could just, you could just buy them off the, from, I don't know. Well, let's, uh, I'm glad to hear that. Can you say a little bit more about the balancing, the difference between balancing the economy versus balancing the budget. I know that based, unless that's too much of just asking you to rehash the entire thing you just did, but uh, it, balancing the economy. That well, is stuck out for me when Vandana was speaking and you did well, a lot of work on that. And I know you feels like you're talking about building it from the bottom up. Well, I think what people are referring to is there's always a question you need to balance the budget, right? You, you, you don't want to be running deficits, and, and which is just nonsensical. It, it plays into the game that sets you up for privatization of Social Security, Medicare, and underfunding programs. I mean, and that's just, there's no discussion there because the deficits aren't a problem. So the question is, you want to make sure that you're adequately spending to run the economy at full speed, and wherever the deficit goes, that's not an issue. So what they're saying, and that is you're balancing the economy, and where the deficits go, the deficits go. That, that's not an issue. I mean, again, the federal deficits are the money spent into circulation that are not taxed back, that they don't have to repay. So it's the responsibility to run those deficits to fully optimize the economy. And if you're failing to do that, there's going to be consequences. I mean, Warren Miller will tell you that the lack of appropriate spending is the cause of unemployment. That unemployment is the federal government's responsibility by inadequately spending. And in fact, his point is this, when you make people require dollars, to pay their taxes and you actually force them onto a money economy and then you don't provide adequate money the government's actually chosen to set unemployment which it never should do and it never has to allow that to happen so the point is you don't worry about the deficit like oh my god 20 trillion is too much i mean if you've got unemployment and people could be doing things in the climate and they're not who cares the deficit's too small i mean father will tell you that right now the deficit is too small and people were saying, well, we have to balance the budget, which, which does, I mean, that is like saying we can't afford Medicare for all, we can only afford the much more expensive garbage one. Right. So the point is, you don't look at the size of the deficit. The question is, is the money supply, which is the mirror image of the federal deficit, up to the task of running the economy where it needs to be? And if it doesn't, you increase the deficit. And there is no issue here. 
The propaganda, of course, for various reasons is that's wrong because they are trying to take advantage of us. But the bottom, so balance the economy, not the budget is, we have a lot of unemployment, we're going into recession. As Stephanie Kelton said, we can spend trillions of trillions of dollars. That will increase the deficit. And as Stephanie Kelton would also say, so what? Right. So I want to invite Mo to, uh, or Maureen to uh, ask probably what is going to be our final question. I was just wondering if UBI could be part of this whole package and solution, universal um, basic income. So UBI, is a, the, the job guarantee is probably really superior over the UBI for several reasons. I hope I'll have time to get to that. But UBI, so Social Security is a UBI for retirement and like A for dependent children is a UBI. But here's the problem with the UBI. The federal job guarantee program is going to say, set the floor at say $18 an hour, 40 hour work week if you want it with benefits and under humane conditions. With the UBI, you say you can get a one-time check a month for say $1,000. So if you work in a poor paying place, pick Walmart, once you've got that $1,000, they're not going to give you a raise. If anything, they can back down on what they're paying you and they don't have to give you benefits. So they're basically, you know, while some of the Walmart workers are currently getting food stamps because they're getting inadequate pay, that's sort of the model of the UBI that for the people who want to uberize the economy, you'll get this $1,000. It's enough to keep you sort of close, not enough. So you still have to go to work, but then give you garbage wages that'll just bring up what you need to survive. Whereas the job guarantee is going to guarantee everybody a living wage and set the floor for the rest of the country. So that's the vastly superior, I think, system. But again, for those who can't work, retirees or people who have disabilities, then the UBI to supplement that is exactly what you want. But the job guarantee and also the job guarantee is counter cyclic. So if you start to go into depression, it's the job guarantee that keep it from snowballing. The UBI is not going to do that because it's not increasing the spending where it's needed. It's worth noting who's pushing the UBI. It's the people that are pushing for an Uberized society. But again, the UBI is great in terms of support for people who need the income support who are not working or shouldn't work or can't work. But the other reason why the UBI is also not an advantage is with the country falling apart, of, for example, with the climate situation, don't pay people not to work, pay people A, the better wage, and send them to work weatherizing homes and doing other useful things. So the UBI isn't employing people to do useful things. It's giving them a low level of money, which means employers can take advantage of that and give even lower offers to them because it's not enough to live on and it sets them up to be further taken advantage of. It's not counter cyclic. There's a lot of problems with it and it doesn't set a floor. So the job guarantee is superior, but you augment that for certain people who can't or shouldn't work with the UBI and that's the perfect combination, I would say. Did, did that answer your question or help or you? Yeah, that helped, that helped. It's uh, thought provoking. Thank and you. I will tell you, if you want more on that, um, there's um, a really excellent podcast called Macro and Cheese. And the last episode was Faddle, who's gonna be here next week, talking specifically about that for an hour, which is always easier than a two minute question. And he really goes into that quite well. So if you just look up Macro and Cheese, the most recent edition is Faddle Kaboob talking for an hour on that. and it's an excellent presentation. So an hour is better than two minutes. I would definitely recommend you take a listen to that. Thank you Thanks. so much, Randy. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you all. Amy Morrison. Yeah, well, thanks everybody. Those were um, excellent questions and thank you, especially to you, Randy. Uh, that was a great presentation. And uh, next Monday at 4.30 uh, Pacific, 7.30 Eastern, we'll have Fadal Kaboob on and he'll be talking about, can the Biden administration achieve more ambitious and transformative goals? Um, so I invite you all to that, spread the word. Um, we'll be sharing the recording of this presentation shortly with you all. And um, thanks for being here. Thank you very much.